service where we are going to uh, share a message. And I, I feel like this is one of the most important messages I've shared. So I'm in some ways excited today to share this message with you. We've been looking at the life of Hezekiah. And so we're going to continue to look at his life today. And again, welcome to any that will be uh, watching online. We welcome you and we do trust this message will be a blessing to you. So my message this morning is, a, is another in the series of messages on the lives of the kings and queens of Judah and Israel. And last Sunday we took our first look at the life of Hezekiah. And what a marvelous, godly man Hezekiah was. He was a breath of fresh air for their country. You know, when a country has godly leaders, the people are better off. And the people rejoiced having Hezekiah as their king. So today we're going to continue to look at another aspect of his life, which I think is really important today. So I'm excited to talk about it with you. And that is his prayer life. Hezekiah's prayer life is the topic of my message today in pursuing God, pursuing the blessing of God. Our scripture reading today is going to be from 2 Kings chapter 19. Would you either follow along or open your Bibles and let's follow this together. Hezekiah received the letter from the messengers. These are messages from the Syrian army commander. And he read it. Then he went up to the temple of the Lord and he spread it out before the Lord. Hezekiah prayed to the Lord, Lord, the God of Israel, enthroned between the cherubim, you alone are God over all the kingdoms of the earth. You have made heaven and earth. Give ear, Lord, and hear. Open your eyes, Lord, and see. Listen to the words of Sennacherib, has sent to ridicule the living God. It's true, Lord, that the Assyrian kings have laid waste to these nations and their lands. They have thrown their gods into the fire and destroyed them, for they were not gods, but only wood and stone fashioned by human hands. Now, Lord, our God, deliver us from his hand so that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that you alone, Lord, are God. Lord, bless this reading of his word. By way of reminder, the theme verse for this series of messages on the lives of the kings and queens of Israel and Judah is this. The eyes, the eyes of the Lord go to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on behalf of those whose heart is loyal to him. The scripture that we read about the life of Hezekiah show us that Hezekiah was a man that God would want to show himself strong on behalf of. Hezekiah was faithful and loyal to the Lord God. Hezekiah's life is filled with outstanding achievements. It's covered in several books of the Bible. You can read about them in 2 Kings, 2 Chronicles, and a large part of the book of Isaiah. Isaiah's life and ministry as a prophet, most of it was during the reign that was 29 years of Hezekiah being king. And Hezekiah and Isaiah had a very special relationship. He became king at the age of 25 and he reigned 29 years. I've shown you a couple of slides on the kings of Israel and Judah and here's the lineup of kings through the years and in my earlier messages that we had on the life of Asa who was king more than four decades and then his son Jehoshaphat and then I had a message on Joash who also reigned 40 years and then uh, we've begun now our look at the life of Hezekiah. Hezekiah. The Bible says about Hezekiah that he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, just as his father David had done. This is the description of Hezekiah as a man. He did what was right. 
But you know, the description goes a lot further when it talks about Hezekiah. He was really special. And the Bible says this about him. Hezekiah trusted in the Lord, the God of Israel, and there was no one like him among the kings of Judah, either before him or after. How about that for a testimony? No one like him before or after. As he held fast to the Lord and he did not cease to follow him, he kept the commands the Lord had given Moses all his days. He loved the Lord. He kept the law of the Lord. He stayed with the Lord. He didn't drift away. He wasn't perfect, but he was a special man. What a king. What a blessing for the nation to have a king like that. And so as our theme verse talks about how God wants to show him strong for a person who's loyal and faithful, this is such a man. This is that kind of man. And the Lord did show himself strong for him. Notice how the Bible summarizes how God blessed him. And the Lord was with him. He was successful in whatever he undertook. You see, God wanted to show himself strong on behalf of a person like that, and he did. And so Hezekiah was amazingly successful because he was faithful and loyal to God. What a testimony. This is the man that came along and was such a blessing to the nation of Judah. But I want to talk about something that's so truly unique and special about him today. And what's so truly unique and special about him is how his life is punctuated by prayer. This man was a man of prayer. And in our scripture reading in chapter 19, we see just one of those times when a great crisis came into his life. And what did he do? He went right into the temple and laid out his case before the Lord and prayed. You know, when he's facing impossible situations, <laughs> that's the thing to do. In our passage this week, King Hezekiah is faced with literally an impossible situation. The king of Assyria, who was the most powerful king in all the earth in that day, after conquering all the surrounding countries, put his focus and aim on Judah. And he's captured nation after nation all around, and then he brings his huge army into Judah. He's already conquered Israel in the north. And he starts knocking off city after city. These are fenced in. They're protected walled cities. And he starts knocking off one after another. And pretty soon after he's taken all the major cities, the armies end up in Jerusalem. A quarter of a million troops surround the city. They cut it off. It's a hopeless situation. Already Hezekiah's army, what there was of it, is pretty much defeated. What's left is tucked inside the walls of the city of Jerusalem. And along comes the commander of the army of Assyria, and he threatens them, I'm going to destroy you too. That was the situation. Surrounded. The commander of the army of Assyria threatening them. It would take a miracle to get out of that mess. This enemy has surrounded the city and cut it off. And Hezekiah, as was his habit, brought the matter to the Lord. And so we read, Hezekiah received the letter. So the commander of the army of Assyria wrote out his demands. He spoke it to the officers and officials up on the walls of the city, and then he handed the paper over, surrender or die. Hezekiah received the letter from the messengers, and he read it. And then he went up to the temple of the Lord, and he spread it out before the Lord. And Hezekiah prayed to the Lord, the Lord, the God of Israel. The letter he had in his hand from the commander of the army of Assyria was threatening to destroy Jerusalem. 
Hezekiah's response was he took the letter and he went up to the temple, the temple of the Lord, and he spread it out before the Lord and he prayed for God's help. King Hezekiah was a devout man and he truly a man of prayer and he takes this crisis situation and he does as he does with every difficulty, every important matter that he faced. He brought the matter to the Lord. As I reflected on these passages of Scripture and reading through the life of Hezekiah the past two weeks, it was Hezekiah's prayers that led me today to want to talk about prayer. One of the most important messages I've probably ever given on the matter of prayer. You know, I'm cautious when I talk about prayer because so much is said about prayer that's sometimes wrong and heaps guilt on people. And so I want to be really careful about this message on prayer because it's really an important subject, really important. There's been much said about prayer which I think is harmful. And so I want to speak on it carefully. You know, it's very callous when a Christian says, the, the flood waters were rising, but I prayed to God for deliverance and he blessed me and he spared my home while the Christian nearby to them is thinking, I prayed the same thing, but my house was destroyed. And that happened recently. The way the first Christian talked, it gives the impression that God loved him and cared about him more than the other. And not only is that callous, I think it's wrong. That kind of thinking that God answers the prayers the way they wanted because they were special is exactly what got the Jews into so much trouble. As you read the Old Testament, you see time and again that the leaders said, we're special, therefore we know things are going to go good for us. Rather, when we talk about God's miraculous deliverance, we need to always do so with humility. Truthfully, we don't know why God will answer one prayer affirmative, affirmatively, but another prayer of someone in a similar case differently. But we do know this, absolutely know this. It's not because we're better or more worthy that God will answer our prayer. He doesn't answer our prayer affirmatively because we're better. <laughs> because we're not. In and of ourselves, we're not more worthy than someone else. It's the grace of God. We need to rather be thankful and continuously lift one another up in prayer and be humble about these matters. I'm confident that each one of us here today has spoken many, many prayers to the Lord. Welcome, brother. I'm glad you're here. I'm confident that each one of us here, everyone in this room, each of you has spoken many prayers to the Lord in times of need. And truly, we all go through trials and hardships at some point in our lives, and, and they continue. You'll get one trial, and after that, you'll get another one. That's our journey in this life. And many of you have had times in your life when you know God has intervened in your circumstances after you prayed. And we can thank the Lord for that. There are many times when I believe that God has responded to my prayers by influencing a situation. And there are many times, but not as often as I want, where God has actually answered a prayer and even brought healing. I was a hospital chaplain in New Brunswick and Every day in the hospital, I would pray for people at their bedsides. And sometimes, sometimes, a miraculous healing came as a result of prayer. And I thank the Lord for that. But many times, no change. 
I've seen healing in response to prayer. And I've also heard many amazing stories and testimonies about God bringing healing to those who were sick, changing external circumstances in ways that could not otherwise be explained, and much more in response to others' prayers. And hearing these stories is encouraging to me. I think it's encouraging to all of us when we hear these testimonies. And again, we thank the Lord. It is such a great thing to hear how someone has been touched by God's care. Ways that God continues to take care of his people in this world. This is a marvelous encouragement. Sharing these stories of God's amazing answers to prayer is an important part of our Christian life. Remember how God has acted in the past was the central theme to all of the feasts in the Bible. So God gave them festivals so they would remember his miraculous deeds that he had done in the past. And so it's important to remember, recite, and tell how God has done things on our behalf, especially in response to prayer. Well, the life of Hezekiah, as I said, his life was punctuated by prayer. Every challenge that came his way, he was moved to pray. And I have a whole bunch of them that I'd love to share, but I don't have time to do it in this message. This week, as I was contemplating this, I came across a research paper that was done on prayer in the scriptures. I was overjoyed to see it. This person who had gone through a great deal of work noted that he found 222 specific prayers in the Bible. 222 specific prayers in the Bible. And then he attempted to share as he researched each one how God answered them and why. What a great paper. Wish I'd written it. So he attempted to share the answers to each prayer and why. And there were, in fact, many on the list where the prayer to God was answered with a no. Does that surprise you? Let me share a few. Some of the examples of the no's in Scripture were Abraham prayed for Ishmael that he might receive the blessing. God said, no, it's going to be from your wife Sarah, Isaac. Moses prayed to be able to go into the promised land. And God said, no. King Saul prayed for guidance. And God said, no. Elijah prayed to die. And God said, no. Jonah prayed to die after he saw that God was merciful to the Ninevites. And God said, no. How about this one? the mother of James and John. She prayed to the Lord, I want you to have my son sit on either side of you in your kingdom. God said no. The Apostle Paul, he prayed to have his thorn in the flesh removed. And God said no. Well, I found this fascinating because God's answers aren't always yes. There's sometimes no, and it's important to remember. It's important to remember that God is not a genie that we can command to do our bidding. He's the sovereign ruler of the universe. And it's helpful for our faith to share how God has answered our prayers, but it's also wise to acknowledge when he hasn't. To acknowledge times when he has not answered our prayer in the way that we wanted him to. God doesn't always give us what we want when we think we want it. <laughs> Have you noticed that? There are many times in my life when God has not answered the prayers that I've prayed. Can we trust as a reason for that? Learning how to trust God under those circumstances when our prayers are not granted is a critical part, a critical part of the Christian life. And it's something best learned 
with the support of brothers and sisters in Christ. We should not be ashamed of those situations, but we should share them and lead on each other. We need the support of our brothers and sisters in Christ, especially when we go through those situations. So indeed, these stories can be a part of your testimony that you share with people why you're a Christian, how God has worked in your life, how he hasn't always answered your prayers, but how he has answered some prayers. And so that leads me to this follow-up question, an important part of this message. When am I supposed to assume God is saying no to my prayer? When am I supposed to assume, as I'm praying for something, that God is saying no? You know, I think this is a really important question. In our passage this week, this scripture that we read is really cool. (laughs) You see, the bad guys have rolled into town with their army and the commander says, your God's told me to do this. He told me to spank you. The bad guys come in and they have told Hezekiah, you can stop praying to God for deliverance. God has said that he wants the bad guys to win. (laughs) Well, let's look at it. Here's what the commander says. Furthermore, I have come to attack and destroy this place without word from the Lord. The Lord himself told me to march out against this country and destroy it. So that's what the commander of the army of Assyria said to the people of Judah. Your God told me to do this. The bad guys list a whole bunch of things that have already happened as evidence that clearly your God wants things to work out this way. So was he telling the truth? No! That was propaganda from the devil. Sometimes that nagging sensation that we have that God is telling us no to something that we're praying about is actually a lie of the devil. For the most part, that's what's going on in this passage. And the doubts that we have about whether God is listening to us, has not heard us, these come from ourselves, our own doubts and insecurities that are so easily manipulated by the enemy, Satan. He wants to manipulate our thinking. Well, how do we know if God has answered my prayer, your prayer, with a no? Okay, I'm going to give you my opinion on this. I think as a general rule, a generic answer, I think we keep on praying about matters until we have a clear answer. We keep on praying. When the answer is no, we may not always understand why. I think every now and then, every once in a while, we live long enough to even realize why the answer was no. I've seen this in my life, and I can look back 20, 25 years back when I was praying something, and now I can understand why God said no. You know, we get sometimes we live long enough to see and realize why God said no. With enough time, we see that maybe God had a better plan. God had a better job in mind. God had a better relationship in mind. He had a better treatment in mind. He had someone else's future in mind. But in the moment while we're praying, we we don't know that future. So in the moment while we're praying, how do we know when God has answered our prayer with a no and that we should just stop praying for it? Are you listening? Because I think this is really important. I want you all to hear it. This is a really important question for every Christian to be comfortable with. Sometimes the Holy Spirit reveals to us that we've been asking for something with the wrong motives. Notice this word from James. He says, when you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives. That you may spend what you get on your pleasures. The book of James is fascinating and he has a whole lot to say about prayer and why prayers won't get answered. 
the way we requ request them. And one of those is really, really important, and it's about motives. That whatever we're praying for, if it's not with the right motives, we can be sure the answer is no. James says having right motives is important and necessary before the Lord will grant our request. Well, that's one important consideration to remember. And here's another. Sometimes we may be asking for something outside of the will and character of God. Jesus said to his disciples, no, oh, I left it out. Oh, sorry. Jesus said, I tell you the truth, my, father's, my father will give you whatever you ask in my name. In John chapter 16, Jesus explains about prayer that God will grant our prayer request when they're done in his name. And what does that mean? I think it clearly means that it's not just we use his name on the end of the prayer. I ask to have a million dollars in Jesus' name. No, what does it mean in Jesus' name? It means in his will, within the character of God's being, that this is the right thing to ask for. So Jesus makes it clear that our requests will only be granted when they are within the will and character of God. Otherwise, God does not answer those prayers in the way that we ask. And that's why it's sometimes, uh, sometimes we say this, that prayer is not just about telling God what we want, but rather it's being open to realize what God wants for us. Let me say that again. That prayer is not just about telling God what we want, but rather being open to realize what God wants for us. When should we stop praying for something that it seems God has not answered? Well, I have a simple answer to that question. If you believe your motives are pure, and unless you believe that your prayer is clearly outside of the will of God, keep praying. Two caveats. If you believe your motives are pure, and you believe that your prayer is within the will of God, as you understand it, keep praying. Keep praying. This is basically the point of the parables that Jesus told in the New Testament, the parable of the persistent widow. Jesus told a parable to show his disciples that they should always pray and not give up. And so he tells a story about a woman who went to a judge and she asked for justice. And he wouldn't give her justice and she kept going back and she kept going back and she kept going back and he finally said, I'm going to give her justice because she's wearing me out. And Jesus told this parable so that they would pray and not give up. And that wasn't enough, so he told another one. And the other one was the, the parable of the, of the persistent friend. Then Jesus said to them, suppose you have a friend and you go to him at midnight and say, friend, lend me three loaves of bread. A friend of mine on a journey has come to me and I have no food to offer him. And suppose the one inside answers, don't bother me. The door is cl already closed and locked up and my children and I are in bed. I can't get up and give you anything. I tell you that even though he will not get up and give you bread because of the friendship, Yet because of the man's persistence, he will surely give up, get up and give him, give you as much as you need. Jesus told this parable and the other parable to talk about prayer. To not give up. To not give up. To keep on praying. In summary, Jesus said after that parable, So I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be open to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds, and the one who knocks, the door will be open. Jesus was saying, keep on asking, and either your prayer will be given to you, or you will learn another way. Keep on praying until whatever you've prayed about is quite literally over. This is what's so great about praying to God. If what we're asking for isn't what's best for the world, 
a part of God's plan, God won't cave in to our request, to our persistence. God will always do what is best and right. So we keep praying and we keep trusting. And yes, that brings up the question, why pray at all if God's going to do whatever he's going to do? And I have two responses to that. The first is remember that prayer is about bringing us, bringing us in line with the will of God. We pray to come into line with the will of God. And so that makes prayer a criti critical part of the Christian life. It's helping to shape us the way God wants us. And a second reason is, how do you know that your prayer isn't intended to be a part of God's action in that situation? And it might just be your prayers together with someone else's prayer that is the, the thing that God is going to use to bring about what you're requesting. So keep praying. Now if we come back to our text in Jerusalem, this passage about Jerusalem, surrounded by a huge army, a huge army that has defeated all the surrounding armies and all the surrounding territories and is threatening to destroy Jerusalem and its occupants, that's pretty bleak. For you and your situation, just imagine the worst possible the worst report possible for you. Think about in your mind for just a moment the worst possible report for you. Just something terrible, terrible news, and the implication is that there's nothing you can do about it. Nothing you can do about it. Well, how did Hezekiah handle this situation? Listen, friends, everything he did is something we can do. Everything Hezekiah did is something you and I can do. He quite literally took this situation to God. Hezekiah took this awful letter and he put it down in his prayer room. Now wouldn't it be neat to have the temple as your prayer room? <laughs> he brought this letter into the temple and laid it out before the Lord. And Hezekiah was also very honest about the situation. Many of the things in this letter that the army commander said was true. They had destroyed and conquered. They conquered all these cities and they conquered all the, quote, gods, small g. There's no sense in sugarcoating anything or hiding anything from the Lord. Sometimes it's very hard to confront what's going on because the reality may be so depressing. But honesty and awareness are very important. And sometimes that's, what, that's about what's going on inside of ourselves. Being honest with your feelings, honest with your doubts and your fears, God can handle that. He can handle your honesty. He's already aware <laughs> of that reality in your life. So finally, Hezekiah prayed, and he prayed based on the character of God. He prayed based on the character of God and not his own worthiness. Not his own worthiness. When we talk about our salvation, we are usually quick to say that it was nothing good in me, but just by the grace of God, that's why we're saved. <laughs> Which is right. But we need to have the same attitude with every prayer. It's not about what's in me, about me at all. It's about God's grace and his mercy and his character. In this case, the Assyrians were not so much saying that God wanted them to win as, it, as they were in fact ridiculing God. And that's how Hezekiah knew that this wasn't God's will. This wasn't God saying no to the situation. The Assyrians were saying that God couldn't help them. So, and so Hezekiah prays. He prays that God should defend his honor in the world. In this case, his focus is on the fact that God is God alone. Nothing at all like those worthless idols that the Assyrians had conquered and destroyed. Hezekiah was saying, did you hear what he... Hezekiah was not saying, God, did you hear what he called you? Trying to manipulate God. Rather, as Jesus told us, we should know that God always acts in line with his character. 
when we see how our prayer lines up with our understanding of God's character, we pray that and we grow. Otherwise, we might be tempted to pray something like, God, if you really love me, you'll do this and this. And you see how that's so manipulative and selfish? And that's not what Hezekiah was doing. Everything that he prayed was based on God's character. And I want to look at it closely. So let's look at it. Hezekiah prayed to the Lord, Lord, the God of Israel, and thrown between the cherubim, you alone are God over all the kingdoms of the earth. You have made heaven and earth. Give ear, Lord, and hear. Open your eyes, Lord, and see. Listen to the words of Sennacherib has sent to ridicule the living God. It is true, Lord, that the Assyrian kings have laid waste to these nations and their lands. They have thrown their gods into the fire and destroyed them, for they were not gods, but only wood and stone fashioned by human hands. Now, Lord, our God, deliver us from his hand so that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that you alone are Lord, Lord our God. What an incredible prayer that Hezekiah prayed. And there are two important parallel prayers in the scriptures that I think show us this is the right kind of prayer. I want to share these briefly. I'll try to make them brief. There are two parallel prayers in the Bible. One that came to mind was the three young Hebrew, the three young Hebrews in Daniel, in Daniel chapter 3. They prayed, if the God we serve exists, then he can rescue us from the fiery furnace. And he can rescue us from your power, O king. But even if he does not rescue us, we want you to know that we will not serve your gods or worship your gold statue you set up. The prayer of these three young Hebrews was, we trust our God, and our God is able to deliver us, both from your disaster you plan for us and from your hand. But even if he doesn't, we're still going to serve him and trust him, and we're not going to serve your false gods. You see how they prayed? The other one is similar, and it's in the New Testament. It comes from the book of Acts when the disciples were brought before the Sanhedrin. And they were threatened with violence. And when they came out of that meeting, they prayed this way. Now, Lord, consider their threats. And grant that your servants may speak your word with all boldness. While you stretch out your hand for healing and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. So they took the threats that came from the Sanhedrin and said, don't you preach in his name. And they said, Lord, consider their threats and give us boldness that we might preach in your name and do the signs and wonders. But they didn't pray that thinking, oh, we'll only do this if God saves us. Both of these prayers are based on God's character. And note that their response is independent of God's answer to their prayer. Whether God answers their prayer the way they've prayed or not, they will continue steadfastly to trust and serve God alone. That's so hard, but it's easier as we go closer to Jesus. Finally, the prayer is something Prayer is something that we can support each other in. When Hezekiah went to the temple, I found it really interesting to know that he didn't go alone. You know, the support of brothers and sisters in prayer is very, very meaningful. And in his prayer, when he went to the temple, he went with Isaiah. Hezekiah and the prophet Isaiah, the son of Amos, cried out in prayer to heaven about this. This is Isaiah's summary. He and the king went together and prayed and they cried out to the Lord. And notice, and the Lord sent an angel who annihilated all the fighting men and the commanders and the officers in the camp of the Assyrian king. And so he withdrew and went to his own land in disgrace. What an amazing miracle took place that day in response to the prayer of Amos uh, 
Isaiah, son of Amos, and Hezekiah. Isaiah and Hezekiah praying to the Lord, and the Lord answered their prayer, and he sent the angel of the Lord out and killed that night 185,000 military troops. And what was left walked away in disgrace and went back home. It had to be a great encouragement to Hezekiah to have Isaiah join him in prayer. And I want to encourage us to do that for each other. And if I can support you in any way with the crisis or the difficulty or the hardship that you're facing, let's do it together. Let's trust him and lift each other up. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, I thank you for this passage of Scripture. I thank you for the life of Hezekiah, a man of prayer and faithfulness who reminds us to call out to you in our times of need and call out to you based on your character and your love for us. And so, Lord, uh, teach us to pray. In Jesus' name, amen.